At this time, will all sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Our recording is good. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the remote hearing on a committee of fire and emergency management. Will council members and staff please turn on these, their videos at this time. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you and good morning. Um, Welcome to today's virtual hearing of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. Today, the committee will be hearing two bills related to fire safety at film production sites, intro 1849, uh, sponsored by myself, and intro 1852, sponsored by Council Member Cornegie. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the other council members who have joined us today so far. Um, I see Council Member Deutsch. And that's it for now. We and Councilmember Maisel, and I'll get back to that as soon as more people join. Um, I, as I mentioned, am Councilmember Joe Borelli. I'm chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. We are here today to discuss two bills, intros 1849 and 1852, which aim to increase safety on film production sites. Before discussing the legislation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging. Uh, a, a very painful fact that these bills were spurred by a very tragic uh, death uh, and, and a loss of life by firefighter Michael Davidson. Uh, he lost his life while responding to a fire uh, at a Manhattan film production site in March of 2018. So I would like to begin with a moment of silence uh, for firefighter Davidson, one of New York City's bravest. Thank you, uh, and thank you to his family who uh, I know uh, are watching us uh, right now as we speak, and uh, I hope uh, this can bring some uh, comfort that this will not likely happen or will be less likely to happen again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're here to discuss legislation to help prevent these sort of tragedies. Uh, the first bill, intro 1849, which I introduce, will require the fire department to establish fire safety provisions governing activities at certain film production locations. In doing so, the department must consider the condition of the production site location and the nature of the production activities, including the proposed use of pyrotechnics and other special effects to determine circumstances requiring the, the department inspection or supervisor or the presence of a production location fire safety management. Uh, additionally, the bill requires the designation of a production location fire safety manager whenever a permit for scouting, rigging, production activities has been obtained by the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. In addition to intro 1849, we'll also hear intro 1852 introduced by Councilmember Cornegie. Uh, intro 1852 will require that prior to conducting any film production activities, authorized by a permit from the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment, an entity must provide the fire commissioner and the local firehouse with blueprints of the proposed location on structural alterations of such location, such as, and specifically, false walls, the presence of potential fire haz hazards. Uh, additionally, the bill would require that prior to being issued a permit for scouting, rigging, or activities, an entity must clear or, or close any health and safety violations at the location where such production activities are to occur. Uh, the committee looks forward to hearing from the administration and the public on introductions being heard today. Uh, in addition to testimony on the legislation, we're interested in any recent policies that have been implemented uh, that both uh, to ensure that both film and television industries are working at the highest safety standards while filming uh, here in New York City and how tragic instances responding to relative uh, emergencies may be prevented in the future. Uh, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to Council Member Cornegie to make his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Borelli, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak about this important fire safety legislation we're hearing today. But I do want to take one second to note 
that while this was an incredible tra tragedy, I want to send a resounding message to other legislative bodies that out of tragedy and crisis, sometimes we can come together and reach across the aisles and, and put together legislation that protects our first responders. And that was done here today. So thank you again, Chair Borelli. There's a memorial plaque erected by the city of New York that reads in part, in memory of Lieutenant Michael R. Davidson, Engine Company 69, who made the ultimate sacrifice while in the performance of his duty. Both these bills, intro 1852 and intro 1849, could have no more fitting a preface as the words on that memorial plaque. These bills speak to upgrading on-site fire safety provisions so that New York's, New York's bravest are better equipped to fight fires on film sets. As we discuss the details of the provisions of these bills, I wanna be sure we keep that overarching goal in mind. To that end, I look forward to hearing from the administration and from all the stakeholders today. Um, and a, a special blessing goes out to his, his family. And I know we can work constructively to equip firefighters with the information they need. I wanna thank the Unify, Unify, Uniform Firefighters Association for sharing your insights and expertise with us. And I also wanna express my appreciation for the help of my colleagues and council staff whose work we are building upon in holding this hearing. I wanna close by expressing my profound appreciation to the tireless advocacy of Eileen Davison and the entire Davison family. Your work to lift up Michael's legacy has gotten us to this hearing today and a legacy of greater safety for all our firefighters. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cornegie. I'd like to recognize that council members Brannon and Cumbrera have also joined uh, this hearing uh, and should be noted. I'd like now like to turn it over to the moderator of today's discussion, the committee council, Josh Kingsley, uh, to go over uh, the normal procedural items prior to the administration's testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Borelli. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, counsel to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee of New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. Uh, after which you'll be unmuted by the host. Uh, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically be announcing who is the next panelist to testify. The first panelist to give testimony will be Chief John Sudnick from the New York City Fire Department. Uh, Chief Sudnick is the Chief of Department. Um, additionally, the following individuals will be available to answer questions on behalf of the administration. Kevin Brennan, who is the Deputy Chief of the Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention, and Kelly Carr, who is the Deputy Co-Development Counsel, also for the Bureau of Fire Prevention. We will also have a representative from the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, uh, the General Counsel, Lori Baird peterson who will also provide testimony, or who will be uh, doing questions and answers. Um, I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should, mit, should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now administer uh, the oath for the representatives of the administration. Uh, before we begin, um, I will, uh, okay, apologies. Um, do you firmly tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Um, we will begin with Chief Sudnick. I do. Deputy Chief Brennan. Ms. Carr? I do. And then Ms. Barrett Peterson. Once we, we got everyone, I think that we'll be uh, ready to begin testimony when you are all ready, if, if everyone's unmuted. Yeah. I think, Chief Sudek, we need you to be unit on mute on your end. Thank you. Okay, got it. Good morning, Chair Borelli, <clears throat> excuse me, and all the council members present. My name is John Sudnick, and I am the Chief of Department at the New York City Fire Department. I'm joined today by Kevin Brennan, Deputy Assistant Chief of the Bureau of Fire Prevention, and Kelly Carr, the Deputy Co-Development Counsel for the Bureau of Fire Prevention. I'm also joined by Lori Barrett-Peterson, General Counsel for the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Council's legislation relating to fire safety measures at film production locations. I'd like to begin by addressing the tragic incident that prompted the legislation and the discussion we're having today. 
on March 23rd, 2018, firefighters responded to a five alarm fire on St. Nicholas Avenue in Harlem. The location was a former jazz club that had been temporarily converted into a movie set. Firefighter, Mike, firefighter Michael R. Davidson was operating a hose line to suppress the fire when he became separated from his fellow firefighters inside rapidly deteriorating conditions. After a desperate search to locate firefighter Davidson, he was transported to Harlem Hospital where he succumbed to injuries sustained in the fire. Firefighter Davidson was a 15 year veteran of the fire department when he died. He was a native of Sunnyside, Queens and the fire department was in his blood. His father served for 26 years in the department. And his brother Eric is an active firefighter serving in Engine Company 88 in the Bronx. On four different occasions, firefighter Davidson was cited for bravery and life saving actions. He was posthumously promoted to the rank of lieutenant. It is an unfortunate reality that the fire department is not new to tragedy. Firefighter Davidson was the 1,150th member to make the supreme sacrifice in the line mm -hmm. of duty. We put a priority on learning from tragic events and we draw from these experiences to make sure that members of the department responding to subsequent incidents are safer and better protected. As with every large incident, FDNY fire marshals performed an investigation of the fire. They determined that the heat from the boiler vent ventilation flue pipe ignited nearby combustible materials, causing the fire in the cellar. Due to pending litiga litigation, we are restricted with how much detail we can discuss here today. However, one of the conclusions of the subsequent health and safety report was that the fact that the location was being used as a film set presented challenges to firefighters who responded to the fire. Among other factors, the set included temporary partitions that created voids, causing confusion and obscuring the fire as it grew. Fire resistant materials had also been removed from the first floor. We are grateful to the sponsors of this legislation and to the council in general for working with us and for prioritizing the safety of our members. Following a review of this incident, there are a number of changes that we'd like to see take place at filming locations in New York to help the department to avoid similarly dangerous situations in the future. We have worked with our colleagues at MOM to make improvements, and we think this legislation can be helpful in improving fire department operations at filming locations and enhancing the safety of our members and the public that we serve. Introduction 1849. A Introduction 1849 is sponsored by Chairperson Borelli and would establish fire safety provisions for film production locations and require production location fire safety managers for certain, certain scouting, rigging, and production activities, as well as pyrotechnic usage. While we have some suggestions for small changes, we are supportive of this bill. This legislation enables the department to establish rules around filming locations, including making sure that construction and alterations of locations used for film sets are completed in a safe manner. One aspect of this bill that we find particularly valuable is that it would require film productions to designate an individual to serve as the production location fire safety manager. Productions will now have someone who will be responsible for periodically inspecting the location, ensuring that permit permits and other necessary approvals have been properly obtained, completing fire safety surveys, and that individual provide the fire department with a point of contact to deal with when on site or responding to an emergency. The legislation also enables the department to make rules designating certain production activities during which FDNY representatives will be on scene. We do want to clarify that the legislation may reference some act activities for which the production company may not need to designate a production location fire safety manager. We recognize the importance of the film industry in New York, and as with every industry that we regulate, we know our safety regulations have an impact on their operation. 
The legislation as drafted would require a production location fire safety manager to be designated when a permit is issued for scouting activities. But in fact, we would not need, we would not have any need to interact with such a person during scouting activities. The rules that we promulgate in accordance with this legislation will be mindful not to impose any burden unnecessarily. The Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment would like to revise the definition of product location to specify that includes, quote, a premises associated with any location approved for the purpose of motion picture, television, or commercial production because their jurisdiction under the charter is limited to exterior public property and the purpose of this legislation includes application to private property, unquote. Introduction 1852 is sponsored by Council Member Cornegi and would require anyone receiving a permit for filming from the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment to provide to the Fire Commissioner and the local firehouse a detailed blueprint of any production location with a penalty for failing to do so, resulting in a revocation of the permit and civil penalty. It would also require that such permits only be issued when all city, state, and federal health and safety violations have been closed or clear. We believe that the first section of the bill requires more from the industry than is of use for the fire department. Blueprints for filming locations would not be particularly valuable for the department, either at headquarters or at the firehouse, as in most cases, blueprints would not be necessary to evaluate fire safety. Such a requirement could be costly and time consuming for production companies to obtain we would remove this provision. The second portion of this bill, section 325.3, has a very useful objective. However, we would suggest that the language be amended to narrow the universe of violations covered by this section to strike a balance between what would be helpful to the department and what would be feasible to administer. The fire department has no mechanism for tracking state and federal violations. As written, the scope of local violations covered by this provision would exceed those necessary to protect the safety arising out of the use of a property for filming. For example, a food related violation for a restaurant would be irrelevant to the filming location in a different part of the building. However, we do think that it would be useful to compel companies to clear outstanding life and safety violations at filming locations. We recommend amending this provision to cover violations issued by the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department that the Fire Department determines constitute a life safety hazard. With these suggested changes, we would support this legislation as well. Regarding both 1849 and 1852, we thank the Council for creating legislation that will improve the safety of first responders as well as members of the film production and the public. We sincerely appreciate the interest of the sponsors in improving the protections and safeguards for our members. We would be happy to continue working with you on suggested changes that I mentioned here today. I will now be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sudnick. Uh, and I, I guess the first uh, question or two is about the uh, current state of obtaining a, a pyrotechnic uh, or special effects permit from the fire department. Uh, basically, how is it done? Uh, how many are issued? Uh, and what are the uh, requirements attached to such permits? Kevin, you want to take that? Okay. Councilman, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, what, what is the current process for obtaining a, a pyrotechnic or special effect permit? Uh, and how many are issued? And what is the requirement of uh, the permit holder uh, for, for those permits? Uh, well, basically, the, they wouldn't require a permit from us to get the uh, permit from MOM. Uh, usually, a pyrotechnic permit would go to our explosives unit, and they would go on scene and conduct a field evaluation of, of the uh, site where that pyrotechnic or special effect activity would be being performed and issue a permit based on their evaluation. Of that I don't have numbers offhand in front of me as to the amount we get per year of uh, special effect permits, but it, uh, it is uh, quite a lot. 
I mean, when we, when we say a lot, is it is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? Is it you know? Uh, I would say it's over a thousand, definitely, and increasing with the uh, amount of uh, activity that MOM experiences in a year, the amount of permits that are filed. And what is the permit for uh, any sort of temporary alteration, including uh, some sort of a temporary partition? That would be the Department of Buildings. But to your, to your knowledge, is there is there a is there any sort of uh, permitting process for folks putting up temporary partitions? That wouldn't involve the fire department. That would that, that wouldn't be under our jurisdiction. Uh, but all. The fire codes in general do apply to any building location where they do filming. I mean, the codes that are currently in effect would apply. You, you can't disable fire protection systems or anything during a film production. But that, that's sort of my point. So if there's some sort of alteration filed uh, to a building, even if it's something very temporary, there, there is no really interaction between the Department of Buildings uh, and the fire department, um, even when there might be combustible materials on the site. It's correct. Um, just an, an opinion question. If, yeah. if, if you had a landlord who subdivided uh, an apartment into, um, you know, an apartment that once had three bedrooms, they subdivided into an apartment with uh, now six bedrooms by putting up temporary partitions uh, and they stored combustible material there and there was a death from a fire in that building. Mm -hmm. Do you think the the city would use its full weight and force to go after that landlord uh, for for every single violation under the sun. Um, I would think so. I mean, anything that's in violation, we want to enforce those violations. Correct. So then, if it's the film industry, when someone's using combustible material and putting up temporary partitions. Um, you know, what, why is that something that we just as a city sort of accept happens with, with limited oversight? I'll defer to you, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I respectfully think that mischaracterizes where we're at. And when this incident happened, we began taking a look at what went wrong. And we took this opportunity to look at what other jurisdictions are doing. Um, and we want to, as you know, Count Chairman Borelli, um, we've introduced a new proposed section of the fire code that would get at the types of materials that are being brought into production locations. And it would in, uh, in fact incorporate uh, and mandate compliance with NFPA 140 around materials that are brought into production locations. And so we, we were supportive of, of your efforts uh, and, and our proposed code change would go even a little further to um, increase safety for the public and for the people that work at these locations and for first responders. But if, if a fire company was doing building inspection and they uh, came upon a, a commercial building um, that had been subdivided without any alteration permits into uh, a different layout than from what was filed with the building department, would that fire and was housing combustible materials? Would that fire company be issuing violations to that premise? Okay, I apologize. I just got unmuted. No problem. Yeah, well, that's only if we knew about that. I mean, a lot of these film productions go on you know, that we don't know about. I mean, MOM gets thousands of permits a year, and that's uh, why we just started to make this connection of sharing information with MOM as far as permits that are being filed. And, you know, there are going to be locations we're going to want to look at from a fire safety perspective, but a lot of this, you know, goes on throughout the city without our knowledge. We don't have that information uh, connection where we get notified of a permit for a film shoot or whatever is going to be conducted and know that there's alterations going on in that building. Uh, it's, it's right. just, that, that just that doesn't in exist. My opinion, 
that, that's what establishes the sort of the necessity of, of this particular piece of legislation that you guys should know about this because if this was happening in any other circumstance in the city of New York, this would trigger action from the uh, from the department and the Department of Buildings uh, and uh, under this scenario also the Office of Media and Entertainment. Um, specifically about 1849, what what considerations would inform um, Never mind. I'm going to skip that one. Um, what activities would the department view as being particularly hazardous? Uh, in other words, that would require uh, some action from a fire safety officer or inspection. Well, if they're doing any kind of alterations to the building, bringing in combustible materials, uh, you know, putting up walls or, or changing the structure of the building, uh, we want to make sure there's no outstanding violations in that building that they chose to use. You know, get a, you know, if there was any outstanding, whether it be fire department or DOB violations, we'd want them cleared up before uh, Mom would approve the permit for to you know use that location. If if the department was to create a, a certificate of fitness for, um, you know, something production location fire safety manager, for example, uh, whatever the title of that that certificate would be, what qualifications and responsibilities would, would be important in that? I, you, you indicated a little bit, uh, Chief Sudnick, about what the person will be doing. So how much different is this from existing certificates and, and what would any change be? So we haven't created the certificate of fitness yet. Uh, we would develop it and it would be modeled most likely on the construction location fire safety manager um, basic fire safety requirements that an individual who would be designated in that title would be responsible for completing, um, likely daily at a production location, um, familiarity with, um, basic familiarity with maintaining means of egress, making sure portable fire extinguishers are where they're supposed to be, things like that. So uh, the individual who was designated would come to fire department headquarters, they would sit for an exam, and they would be awarded the certificate of fitness after demonstrating basic proficiency in those areas. Any specific uh, portions of that, fit, that certificate program about combustible materials used in temporary partitions or um, you know, combustible materials obviously used in, in, in pyrotechnics? It hasn't been written yet, but it will. But it will. That's, that's, that's what I, I was hoping to hear. <laughs> yes. On 1842, um, I know in your testimony, uh, the chief said that there may not be a need to notify local companies uh, w with respect to getting them a set of blueprints. And I can understand why that's certainly costly uh, and time consuming, but what other way could we alert a responding uh, company that the inside of the premises, A, might not be uh, what they're traditionally and, and typically responding to of that type of building, and B, that it might have combustible materials resulting from a film production. But how, how do we let them know is my, is my question. I, I think that this, uh, the, these bills and our code will go a long way toward, um, toward notifying, making those notifications to the local units. Um, you know, we also had another tragic fire, if you remember correctly, at the Deutsche Bank, which required CDA inspections uh, for, um, for our companies to go and perform familiarization drills. So I, I would uh, envision that this would be something similar to that, where a company, a local fire company, would get notif notified um, prior to uh, the set being uh, constructed, and they'd have an opportunity to go there and conduct familiarization drills, walkthroughs, and those are a far more um, a far more efficacy for our units than would a blueprint, uh, where you know we don't have a lot of architects uh, that are, that are on our staff in the firehouses that could you know basically uh, translate those blueprints. So actually getting in and seeing the set uh, as it is constructed is the is the best is the best opportunity for us in these situations. And are, are you aware of any specific type of uh, alterations or, or structural material that would be particularly dangerous? Is there anything we should look at as far as barring, if there's some sort of temporary wall um, material that, that, that we should outlaw? Okay, you take care. I should say that uh, the fire department after um, 
the death of firefighter Davidson, you know, we, we started a process of coordinating with MOM and the citywide event coordination agency that takes the permit data in. And we're in the process of acquiring a year's worth of this permit data so that we can conduct an, an analysis between fire safety activity and permit activity. And we're hopeful that uh, we'll see a correlation. Um, and if we don't, you know, part of what we're looking to do too is, inter is increase our agency coordination with DOB. We'll be looking at where and when uh, permit uh, uh, alteration activity arises to the level of requiring a DOB work permit. Um, certainly that's activity that we would be interested in. And then that would help us know where to direct our units for familiarization. Okay, I, I think that's my last question for now. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Chairman Cornegy uh, for, for his questions. Chair Borelli, it seems we have lost uh, uh, Councilmember Cornegy. Okay, uh, did any other council members uh, raise their hand, Josh, to ask questions? I don't, I don't believe so, but if any members uh, would like to uh, ask a question now, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, and if, if not, we could uh, and then move back to the chair and, and kind of wrap things up on this angle. Um, so maybe Chair Borelli, maybe give a minute or two and then we could uh, and move forward if no one else has any questions. Yep, uh, hold, hold tight one second. I'll, I'll send uh, Corny a text message. All right, let's move on to the uh, next panel. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, admin folks, we appreciate you uh, participating here and we'll, we'll move on from here. Um, we're now gonna move on to the public testimony section of the hearing. Um, for uh, this section, um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike at our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist use the raise hand function on Zoom and we will call on you after uh, the individual has completed their testimony. Um, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you can begin delivering your testimony. Um, so we will begin today with a representative from the Uniform Firefighters Association of New York, uh, Robert Eustessi. Um, I believe that you should be unmuted and you could uh, go when you are ready. Uh, thank you. Uh... For those that don't know me, my name is Bobby Eustace. I'm the uh, vice president of the Uniform Firefighter Association. Uh, I was also a firefighter in the Live 27 in the Bronx in the same division uh, as Michael Davidson. And I worked with him many, many years. Uh, I was a friend of Mike. Um, and I also worked with the Teamsters 817 for 12 years. So uh, I have experience in both firefighting and actually loading up the scenery in both of these. Um, and uh, having worked with uh, Mike's brother, Eric, uh, for many years uh, right next to me in the Bronx uh, and Eileen uh, on both these bills. Uh, we both as a union uh, and as a friend uh, and as, as, as a fellow firefighter uh, have very, very strong opinions about both these bills. And uh, I want to thank Chairman Borelli, uh, Chairman uh, Councilman Cornegy for all their assistance with both these bills. Uh, a lot was covered already on these bills. We've, we've all kind of uh, touched on a lot of them. Uh, Basically, the, the big issue for us, too, is, is notifying uh, the local firehouse. Uh, we as firefighters are trained to go into pretty much and mitigate any type of situation we get, no matter what the danger is. Um, but we spend an awful amount of time studying building construction and studying it from the outside, studying it from the inside. Uh, if we see certain type of structures, we don't go inside. Uh, if you see those old type of bowling alley roofs and there's a large amount of fire, it's called a bowstring truss. We don't go on it because it could collapse. 
um, this is what we study. So when you go into a movie set and you see some of the amazing work they do with scenery and everything else, um, that changes how our operations are because we assume it's one thing, we assume it's another. Um, in, in this set alone, if you look at the pictures on the movie set, there looks like there's large wood beams on top of the ceiling. Those were in fact foam and hollow. Uh, and those are, those are very dangerous things that we don't understand uh, or we can't predict when we walk into a fire. So um, one of the things that happens in the permit world, and, and we understand that there's money involved and, and you know, obviously it's a revenue stream for the city. And especially in these times right now, the last thing we're gonna try to do is get in the way of stopping any revenue streams. Um, but what's really important is that you got to give us a fighting chance. And um, the chief's right. We're not going to be able to read blueprints. Um, and we're not going to argue, take the word blueprints out, but there still needs to be a notification to the local firehouse. There has to be. Uh, having a bunch of permits passed around by a bunch of administrations and chiefs is not going to get down to the local companies. The only way we're going to know the rank and file is ever going to do any type of safety check is if we're given that permit or some sort of notification that something's changed, that we're gonna walk into a building and all of a sudden it's gonna look like Disneyland. Uh, and we're not gonna know that unless someone tells us. And there's thousands of permits given out every year, all different types of material, and we need a fighting chance. And uh, those are the spirits of these bills. That's what Eileen Davidson's for. That's what Eric Davidson's fighting for. That's what the Davidson family's fighting for. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here today on behalf of you know, the 8,000 plus uniformed firefighters uh, in New York City and, and just trying to give us a fighting chance. And uh, it's great that the permits know and everything else like that, but if we don't know in the firehouse, th there's just no chance to help us. So thank you for your time. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Vice President Eustace. I, I have a couple of questions. You, you started by describing uh, a similar scenario where um, you're alerted to the presence of a specific type of roof. Can, can you just go through how a notification similar to the one we're hoping to include for film sets would be given to a company to like say the officer of the company and, and it would trickle down to, to the rest of the members of the company in a similar so, circumstance? Uh, well, certain situations, the chief mentioned it before, if there's a, uh, after Deutsche Bank and different things, we have a building inspection operation that we do and there'll be information given down uh, through the chain of command. So if there's a, an alteration or a building that needs to be uh, inspected or, or something that's been alerted to us It'll be sent down to the chain of command. The local company will be alerted that they need to, to notify. They need to uh, take a look at it, inspect it, and, and go out. Um, there's also buildings um, that are vacant in New York City, and they're designated with a box outside. So if you see a building that's got a, a square box spray painted on it in orange paint, that means it's vacant. If it has an X in it, um, it, it means there's levels of how, how you know, uh, derelict the building is and what type of condition it is. Uh, if there's a box with an X in it, we don't go into that building or we try not to. Uh, obviously, if there's a chance of life, we go in there to, to search for life. Uh, but we try not to go into those buildings because obviously there's a great danger to us and our members to move into that. Um, but if we're alerted to those things, we'll check those out on our building inspections. But again, a lot of these movie studios, um, they spend a lot of money and time and effort to disguise these things. I mean, if, uh, if you're spending $20 million to have J-Lo be your actress, you're obviously not going to advertise that in the neighborhood. It's going to slow down production. So you're going to do everything you can to disguise that. And in turn, we're not going to know that. So um, this is something that we need to be alerted to. And like I said, there's different things we study in buildings when you look at them. Uh, even when we're going around, it's just kind of like us, uh, the firefighter talking shop. When you look at different buildings, you look at the fire escapes and how windows line up and, you know, how we, how we would access those. You know, you know, New York City has a lot of security over 100 years, and uh, it's our job to, to gain access to that and how to get around that. So we're constantly brainstorming and thinking about how, how the buildings are built, how the buildings are designed, uh, and how to overcome that and get around that. So um, when something like a movie studio is set into that, that completely throws us way off. Because well, certain let's, things... Let's go on with that, because you worked with Firefighter Davidson for many years, as you said. Um, how confident do you think he was going into that building uh, that he knew the layout or roughly the layout uh, of that building on, on that night? And how, and how disorienting um, could it be if there are different partitions and walls set up uh, that, that are, number one, not legal, number two, uh, you know, just in and of themselves uh, causing a blockage of, of different 
normally situated hallways and passages? Probably extremely, uh, judging by the fact that he passed the lieutenant's exam. I mean, uh, a strong, strong portion of passing any exams in the New York City Fire Department is studying our books and studying the rules. Uh, different buildings have rules. Brownstone buildings have rules of you know, how the floors are laid out and how the buildings are and what rooms are and, and where they're laid out. Uh, old law tenements, new law tenements, uh, what we call taxpayers, commercial occupations, uh, high rise buildings. Um, they all have, you know, basically a, a standard that we know that um, firefighting isn't like the movies where you can see what's going on. It's pitch black. So you need to have an understanding of where, you know, what the structural standards and what the, what the basics are of where you're going. So automatically you're going in and you're understanding that, you know, this has a basement or this has a sub cellar, which is two floors below that. Um, and, and you, how would you ventilate that? Where would the access be to that window? How would we, would we have to cut a hole? Do we have to cut a hole in concrete sometimes? Do we have to cut a hole right in the floor to get, you know, the, uh, you know, the superheated gas or the smoke to, to exit out there? So you're going in and you're looking at a building, even something as simple as the staircase that someone may take example. If it looks like a stoop, is it, is it a brownstone? Is it a four story or is it a tenement? Has the staircase been removed because it, it, it looks different? These are all things that, 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 come into play when we, we size up a building. How are the wind, like I said, are the windows lined up? These are all different aspects that we, we look at different things that automatically, where are we going? Um, even our operations, uh, where you send the first hose line goes in different operations, you know, at a building, it will go to the fire floor. It might go to the floor below, the floor above. Um, at this particular fire, the second line always goes to the floor above. It actually went two floors above because they were confused about the type of structure on this building. Their fire went, their line went first all the way down. They went into the basement. The, the level floor where the second line should have went actually went one floor above. So they actually skipped a line. And that was all based on the front of the look of the building uh, and the confusion of what it looked like. That was a, a prime example of what happened at this very fire. And you also well, talked about, uh, just to go on a little bit, you also kind of, I didn't know where you were going before about the building dividing with the bedrooms. But That's you what touched I want to ask you about next. You touched on the tragedy that was called Black Sunday, right? Which was also two gentlemen that, that died. That was from my company in Ladder Twenty Seven in the Bronx, where that was an illegal compartmented apartment up in the Bronx that caused these gentlemen to jump out of a fifth story window because that was illegally compartmented and there's no notification of that either. And fire was able to travel, uh, you know, through through that building as well. Does it seem like there's a different response uh, when it's uh, you know a landlord trying to uh, pack in as many uh, you know? poor immigrants or and anyone in the community, right, uh, into uh, subdivided apartments. It seems, it seems to me that there's a different response, uh, that when it's the film industry, it's a little sexier uh, and a little less, um, there's a little less force behind our enforcement of these rules. And from your standpoint as a firefighter, if you're responding to a building that has been illegally converted to just house a bunch more people, um, is it any different between that and a film set? It can, it can be tremendously. It can be tremendously. And maybe I know that because working as a teamster and loading in scenery, uh, loading in large, large pieces of scenery that are made of foam. Um, we train with uh, what basically particle board, which is wood chips and glue, which burns at a much, much higher temperature. And, and, and it's called a flashover simulator that we do to train with. That's some of the materials that these guys use. Some of the, you know, high, high burning temperatures and, and things that'll, that, that just burn at a much higher temperature. That's what these are loaded with plastics and everything else like that. That's going to completely change what type of environment you're walking into. It's not just a, you're not just recreating another kitchen. You know, you're, you're recreating, you know, Disney. Like I said, it could be a, a cartoon scene. It could be something, you know, tremendous beyond that. Um, you know, in this scene, it's believed that Mike, Mike Davidson went behind the bar and got stuck, uh, you know, you know, when on his exiting out there, your, your exits and entries and, 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 you know, ebbs and flows of where you're going in the building, you're completely thrown off on a set. That's a movie set like that. You just don't, you normally know going in, you know, how to go, how far you go. You know, it's something we train on where we have our masks, our air tanks that you have, you know, there's a time limit. There's an alert to get in and out. And you know how far you've gone in and how far you've gone out. You know, after the Black Sunday tragedy, we all had personal ropes given to us in case we have to jump out the window. But when you're trained, when you're searching, going along, you mark, all right, here's a window. Here's something I have. You're always conscious of what your exits and exits are, you know, entries and exits are. 
So in, in this particular building, things were, were, were padded up. You know, gentlemen on the outside that were trying to vent it were hitting walls because it was covered up by the movie set, which was, in this case, a stage. So everything is thrown off right there. So if you, if you see that, you're assuming there's got to be a window somewhere. If you saw a window on the outside and you're going along a wall and it's covered up, you may think, oh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I need to go farther. And you may be going deeper into a building thinking you're going to find that window eventually. Um, it, it completely throws us way off because things, these just aren't the characteristics that, that should be in these traditional structures. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I have no more questions for you, uh, Bobby. Um, we'll give it a second to see if any members raise their hand. And if not, we will uh, go to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Mr. Eustace. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, Stephen Waroni from the American uh, Chemistry Council will now testify. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. New York City Council members and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide input on intro 1852. My name is Stephen Myroni and I represent the American Chemistry Council Center for the Polyurethane Industry. ACC supports efforts to increase, in, increase the fire safety materials made with the products of chemistry that are used in the built environment. We want to be part of the solution to support and protect our first responders. We rely on firefighters as a key component of our overall fire safety initiatives at our manufacturing facilities and offices. We are engaged in ongoing partnerships to provide training, equipment, and support for firefighters. Last year, our TransCare program trained more than 40,000 first responders throughout North America. Our 24-7 emergency response call center, ChemTrack, establishes links between shippers, carriers, and emergency responders and medical professionals. We support providing first responders with the necessary information to protect themselves, the public, and property in New York City. ACC believes proactive communication between fire departments and production companies is the most complete way to ensure first responders understand what challenges may be present due to the unique nature of production studios. Polyurethane products have been used safely in homes, office building cars, and movie sets since the 1950s. Polyurethane products, like many products present in our daily lives, are combustible. Polyurethane products can be used safely because they comply with robust fire safety standards developed at the local, state, and federal levels. For example, the fire safety of mattresses, which contain polyurethane foam, are regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Fire safety requirements for polyurethane foam insulation are included in the New York City Building Code. Polyurethane foam products such as upholstered furniture, mattresses, automobiles, and insulation are well understood and used safely in everyday life. These products are no different than the polyurethane products used in movie and film sets. We are concerned that this legislation unfairly stigmatizes a product that complies with robust fire safety standards and narrowly drawing the reporting requirements may not fully achieve the intent of increasing fire safety. We encourage the council to consider revising the approach to better provide first responders critical fire safety information and are willing to work with the council to refine the proposal. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. If, you. if you could just summarize what, what change you, you think would, would be beneficial, um, but would not substantially change the purpose, um, you know, please do so. Be, be, be specific as you want. Um, I'm just one of those people who'd rather talk publicly than, than privately. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that there's value in reporting the use of uh, couches, mattresses, and other standard, you know, building poly, you know, polyurethane products that are used in everyday life as part of the, the, the information passed to the firefighters. But at the same point, I don't want to presume to understand exactly what information firefighters need. So I think some dialogue between you know, the first responders, the council and us could, could help refine that proposal. Have you guys uh, as an organization ever had these rules uh, promulgated in any other large city? Uh, to my knowledge, no. Specific to reporting polyurethane to local use of polyurethane products to the fire department, I do not believe there's any other restrictions. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I see no questions here for you. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, next uh, panelist. That is, that is it. Who's uh, registered? If anyone else uh, would like to register, please speak up or forever hold your peace. And if not, uh, Councilmember Borelli, we're ready to wrap it up on your. Uh, you know, thank you very much for everyone participating uh, and, and thank you 
specifically to firefighter Davidson's uh, wife uh, and his brother, uh, whom I know this probably was uh, more painful and more personal for them uh, than it was for us who, who, you know, approach these things sometimes from a me mechanical point of view on, on how we can do things better. Um, and we, we lose some of the raw emotion. So I want to thank you both for uh, being a part of this hearing. Um, and I want to thank the UFA um, for bringing this to my attention uh, two years ago um, in the, I guess, the winter of 2018. Uh, you know, Bobby, uh, you were there and some of your predecessors were there. And, and I just want to uh, really give you guys a, a shout out for making this uh, uh, become the priority for this committee. Uh, you know, in, in, in this term. So thank you very much uh, to the Uniform Firefighters Association, uh, to your new president, uh, uh, who uh, hopefully uh, uh, we get him at the next hearing uh, if, uh, at some point soon, and, and to his predecessor, who was uh, instrumental in pushing this, uh, and uh, Leroy McGinnis, who was also uh, very instrumental in, in pushing this uh, very early on. So it's one of those things where people should be uh, very happy with the, the work that, that the team at the UFA did. So uh, thank you very much. And if no one else has any testimony, uh, we will uh, gavel out and thank you very much.